Greetings to everyone in the room and in the room where it's not happening. Um, today is a time change. Those of us who arrived an hour early um, apologize for doing so. I don't know where you live, but I live near where some roosters live, and they were very noisy this morning. Like, come on, people, wake up. It's time to get up. They're still on a different time zone. Announcements for today. Uh, for those of you who uh, cannot wait to return to an open Sunday worship service, you have one more week to go. We'll have in-person worship starting Sunday, November 14 at 10 a.m. That's next Sunday. For those who are not yet comfortable returning to in-person, or if you're out of town, we will continue to live stream the service on BoxCast. If you are attending the service, you'll need to wear a mask, sign in, and have your temperature taken. Keep six feet space between you and others, and depart right after the service finishes. Everyone will wear masks although the fully vaccinated choir will sing with Max on, masks on for the anthem, during hymns, they and the congregants may only hum. At some point, we will be able to sing together, but not just yet. Please arrive a little early to allow for the check-in process. And this is all due to the fact that our uh, local infection numbers are going down. So we're feeling that we can safely uh, return to some sort of in-service, in-person service. On November 10th, Stewardship Committee and numerous volunteers will be dropping off a stewardship packet to local addresses. A baked good will be included. If you would like a gluten-free alternative, please contact Laura Lee in the Sh uh, Shalom office by the end of the day on Monday. And mark your calendars for next Saturday, November 13, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We will have our fall cleanup day at Shalom. This is mostly leaf raking, but we'll also include some general grounds upkeep. Hot chocolate, coffee, and spud nuts will be served. That should bring them in. Bring your rakes and join us for some fresh air, exercise, and good conversation. If you have questions, please contact Property Committee Chair Bruce Rathbone. Any other announcements? Please join me in our call to worship. Praise be to God. Praise the creator of all life. I will praise God as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God all my life long. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. God executes justice for the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. God sets prisoners free and lifts up those who are bowed down. God watches over the stranger and upholds the orphan and the widow. God will reign forever. Praise be to God. Would you join us now for the hymnal, uh, number 26 in our hymnals? We worship you, God.
Thank you very much, Molly, for leading us. Uh, joys and concerns. It's a long list. Um, Judy Johansson had a double mastectomy last week, last Wednesday. Surgery went well, and she is recovering at home. I know we all send our best wishes. Mary Watson is still awaiting her surgery date. It will be a long recovery, at least a week in the hospital, and then another six to eight weeks recovering at home. She's been told that she will likely lose her hearing in one ear. Keep her in your prayers as well. Debbie Shea passed away on November 1st at the age of 61. She attended Shalom in a motorized chair when she could. Prayers for her husband, Keith. J Jan Norman would like to request prayers for their wonderful, beautiful 31-year-old grandniece, Courtney Gesford, who just had her fourth brain surgery for cancer at the UCSF Hospital. This time it is in stage four. She has had uh, such a positive attitude throughout these many years and has been an advocate on TV for people who suffer from this malady and has generated much financial support for others who also suffer from these circumstances. Jim Miller, the father to Rachel Reeder and Lynn Neely and grandfather to Elizabeth Neely, passed away last Thursday. He had attended Shalom for many years. Please keep his family in your thoughts and prayers. At the age of 101, he had a, a full life. Pers personally, uh, for the last several years, I've had to defer maintenance for myself uh, because I've been taking care of Chris. Uh, but recently, I'm uh, getting back to seeing my doctors, getting things corrected. Uh, somehow or other, I've developed plantar fasciitis on my right foot, which seems to have broken a toe on the left foot. Those of you who can see, see. Um, I was also able to travel to, uh, to the Los Angeles-San Diego area uh, to see my son, my oldest son in San Diego and to attend a uh, birthday shower with a friend of mine who's becoming a grandmother uh, for the first time by her daughter. I've also managed to get to Lincoln City, Oregon, uh, and this is all very exciting to me because I haven't been able to travel in four or five years since I have been taking care of Chris. Uh, Chris, on the other hand, is uh, her health is pretty good. Uh, but her cognitive uh, state continues to decline. I've got so many pieces of paper up here. Let us join together in the prayers of the people. We will insert a time of silence between each petition. Loving God, you never leave us alone, nor fail to watch out for our well-being, restoring us and providing for us. Because you are faithful, we come to you now to make our petitions known to you. We pray for the church and its leaders. May we continue to be living witnesses for you. We pray for the global community, and, uh, enable us to serve those in need and work for peace. We pray for all those who are cheated and abused Help us be advocates for the powerless that we might enact justice. We pray for those who suffer, 
make us agents of your restoration and healing. We pray for your creation. Make us good stewards that many generations will know the goodness of your gifts. We remember those who have come to their eternal rest. Help us to comfort those who grieve their loss. We lift up to you the prayers we hold secretly, for we believe that you know all things. All these things we ask in your holy name. Amen. I have to offer my apologies to Pastor Steve. I mismarked my copy of the bulletin. He was supposed to read the prayers of the people. Would you like to switch and do the scripture reading? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you preach if you'd like. <laughs>
Oh, we would be in trouble with that. <laughs> okay. Um, today's reading is from Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 to 44, in the New Revised Edition. In his teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who, walk, who like to walk around in long robes, and like greetings in the marketplace, and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. As he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box, many rich people put in large sums. But a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called to his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Thus ends our reading. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for leading us today. It is so good to have you back with us in service. And our thoughts and prayers are with you and, uh, and, and Chris in this time as well. The only concern that I wanted to raise in addition to those that uh, were shared earlier were, uh, was the, um, the COP26 of the United Nations Climate Change Conference that's taking place now through November the 12th in Glasgow, Scotland. We need to continue to pray for the work of all nations as we seek to care for uh, the most important resource that we have, which is our earth and our care for that earth, uh, for, our, for our earth and, uh, and to halt global warming uh, before it uh, destroys us all. So we ask that you continue uh, in your times of remembrance and prayer to, to remember that work taking place uh, internationally. There's a popular saying in progressive churches that goes something like this. All means all, right? We know that. All means what? All. all. Next Sunday we'll have more people here and they'll be able to respond in, <laughs> in greater gusto. <laughs> all means all. It's a saying of, of our hope and our desire for inclusivity for no one to be left behind. Indeed, we desire to be all-inclusive, always welcoming, to be considerate of all, and that's what we mean by the word all. All means all. Inclusive. Inclusivity uh, calls us to be intentional in that, and sometimes we're challenged by that because it's hard to be all-inclusive. However, I've also noticed the word all to mean sometimes exactly the opposite. There's another way to use the word all that is not inclusive, at least not all inclusive, and in fact it can be used for sectarian or partisan purposes. For example, if I were to say all of us believe in a particular belief, or all of us live in a particular way, or, or I could say, uh, for example, uh, all of us here in the sanctuary and online are good people, of which I'm sure we'd get an amen. But, but, there, but there is kind of an unspoken assumption, or it could be, that all of us are good people. All of them, we're not quite so sure about, right? There's the all of us and the all of them. So all can be used in a variety of ways to be inclusive, but it also can uh, bring forth a, a specter of division. Today's scripture uses all in, in both ways. And I want to kind of do a word study, a little bit of a word study 
on the word all, because the word all shows up 12 times in the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And one third of those references to the word all is in this short reading that was shared just a moment ago about the poor widow, the woman who gave everything she had. I think this poor widow has something to teach us about the meaning of all. But to understand the widow's example, we first need to consider the more dominant influence in today's scripture. For there is a group of men known in the ancient, Palestine, ancient Palestinian world as the scribes, right? That was the first part of the reading, the scribes, which are often associated with other groups in, in, of religion uh, in, the Old in the New Testament, like Pharisees. Often we say Pharisees and scribes, or scribes and Pharisees. But the two were not necessarily the same. The scribes were a group like any other in, in, in the ancient world. They were leaders in the world of finance, they were political leaders, and their political prowess, their financial shrewdness, put them into a class all their own. Through their associations, the scribes controlled in that religious world much of the money and much of the influence and much of the power. And if they were good scribes, that might have been okay, but there were corrupt scribes, right? Like there are with any human endeavor. And the corrupt scribes wanted it all. They wanted all the money they could make. They wanted all the power they could take. They wanted all the influence. They wanted to be in the center of attention, to be at the limelight. And so Jesus talks about these scribes parading around town and seeking the center of attention, seeking respect, seeking to be acknowledged. They wanted the best seats in the synagogue where they could wield their power and influence. They wanted it all to the point they would do anything for it. Jesus describes in the scripture how the scribes would rob widows. He, he refers to them as devouring the houses of widows, preying upon others for personal gain, especially the most vulnerable. But Jesus take note, takes note of these showy scribes, and while he's teaching in the temple that day, uh, saying, beware of the scribes to the disciples, beware of the scribes, don't be like the scribes, don't imitate the scribes. In the midst of this teaching, steps into the temple gates a stark contrast. For in, in distinction of these attention-getting scribes, there is a, a woman who enters the temple gates and comes into the church treasury or the church center, uh, the center of the church where the church treasury is. And Jesus takes note of her and uses her to teach about faith. And as she enters the, uh, the temple, she puts in two copper coins, two small coins. I think Richard said it's about the, the equivalent of a penny. In the, in the ancient culture, it was about the equivalent, a penny, I guess, went further in these, those days because it was about the equivalent of a, of a meal uh, for her. But, but she took that and she put it into the treasury and Jesus watches her and takes note of her example and uses that opportunity to teach about faith. The disciples are told that the widow with her two small coins has put in more than all those others in the temple. And now this is where we get to the, this study of the, of the word all. Because this word, this Greek word for all is used four times, just four times, in two sentences. And the Greek, Greek root for this word is pas, P-A-S, pas. And it shows up four times. Pas meaning total or everything or all. Listen again to the scripture uh, and, and listen for this word. Jesus called his disciples to them and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. So that's all of them, right? For all of them contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything, pas, all, all she had to live on. Now, that emphasis is noteworthy, I think, this word showing up four times in two sentences. However, 
it becomes more important if we take a, a larger look at the context of this teaching. Because just a few short verses later, or, or, or earlier, there is another teaching of Jesus that uses this word all multiple times. It's a, it's a teaching that's very familiar to us. In fact, it was read last Sunday. Mark 12, 28 through 30. Listen to the scripture. One of the scribes, this happens to be a good scribe, one of the scribes came up and asked Jesus, which commandment is first of all? And Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And I don't believe this is a coincidence. This word showing up time and time and time again in this very short teaching in the Gospel of Mark. There's a clear connection between these two teachings. There's a stress on this word, all. That we're to love God with all that we have, with our whole self, with all that we are, with, with our whole being. And then the widow, in a few short verses later, demonstrates this all-encompassing trust. And Jesus singles her out as a model of faithfulness with this simple action of giving her all. Now, these observations might be uh, fascinating for an academic paper, wouldn't you think? But what does it have to do with you and me? How does this impact our lives? Well, I think this is a lesson in contrasts. It is a teaching about two paths of life, two ways of life, two ways of looking at the world, that we have a choice in how we seek to live. We can imitate the ways of the scribe, in today's story, that is, we can place a greater value on desiring to acquire, on dedicating our life to making more, on accumulating more, on wielding greater power, on attracting more attention. That's what the scribes did. And in fact, that's kind of what ex our society expects us to do, right? It, it expects us to, uh, to accumulate as much prestige or power or materialism or possessions that we can. But in doing so, we lose our way, we can lose our focus. And without recognizing, rec recognizing it, we can turn our attention from the reasons that we've been created and, and our purpose for life and put our focus on ourselves or our, our possessions. As Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But Jesus held up this widow as a model for, her, for his disciples, a model on how to love God, and a model on how to live our lives. As first century theologian uh, Augustine said, our duty is to present all of who we are to God, our whole lives, all that we are. We are to offer God. Scripture teaches me that God wants of me my, all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, all of my understanding, all of who I am. So here we are in the midst of a stewardship emphasis. And by the way, last Sunday was so brilliantly done by our leaders in the stewardship committee. Wonderful uh, sharing that we had last week. So what does this word all have to do with stewardship and our stewardship emphasis? Does that mean we're supposed to give everything we have to shalom, does it mean we're supposed to put everything we have onto that pledge card next Sunday? No, I don't think so. But this teaching is a reminder that we have two ways of life, two paths. And the calling of Jesus is a path of generosity, a path to give of our life in response to the generosity that we've received. John Wesley had a, a great or a very, I guess, a very popular sermon uh, that he would preach in many different places. The, the, uh, the old uh, circuit preacher of the United Methodist Church would travel from uh, congregation to congregation, and he would often preach this message on financial stewardship. And it went something like this. 
Wesley would get into the pulpit and say to the congregation, work all that you can. Work all that you can. To which the congregation would say, amen. We'll work all that we can. And then John Wesley would say, work all that you can uh, to make all the money that you can. <laughs> to which the congregation would say, amen. We'll work as hard as we can to make all the money that we can. And then he would have the third point. Work all that you can to make all the money that you can so you can give away all that you can. To which the congregation met that with a resounding silence. <laughs> and, and one uh, individual came up to Wesley after that sermon and said, you know, it, it's such a shame to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to have a good sermon until you get to that last point. <laughs> But the last point is the point. It's a call to generosity. It's a call to exhibit a generous heart. The widow demonstrated a generous heart. She demonstrated a, ge a generous and resilient heart. And in the context of our stewardship theme, life finds a way. Even in the midst of challenging times, the widow found a way to share. It was important for her to share what she could, and so it is for us. We who have experienced generosity in our time, uh, we who have experienced resilience in these days, may we consider how we can grow in dedicating all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. For all means all. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 223, What Wondrous Love Is This?
first Sunday of the month, it is our joy to share together in Holy Communion. And so we in the sanctuary have these uh, lovely cups and, and pieces of bread to share. I hope at uh, wherever you are watching at home that you can also find some elements to share in this time of communion, something to drink, something to eat, so that we can share together. I do look forward to the next time we have communion for us to be in, in, in one place, uh, as, as many as we can, to share in person in this time. But now we share communion, our common union in God uh, here and at home, and we invite you to share the liturgy that is printed in your program for today. God be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give God thanks and praise. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this my body is given for you. This do in remembrance of him. After supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this is the new covenant for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. This do in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Our loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the dominion, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the life that Christ gives. Eat this, for this is the gift of God given for you. drink this, for this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we give thanks for you have nourished us at your table, assured us of your love, and strengthened us to walk in faith. Go with us as we go from our many tables, filled with your spirit, for you have revealed yourself to us in the breaking of the bread, in your holy name we pray, amen. For our stewardship emphasis, we have a special treat. Uh, one of our newest uh, employees and workers at the church, Ashley, Ashley, pardon me, Ashley McKinney, is going to come and introduce uh, a lovely gift that our young people have prepared for us today, a youth video on a, a very important subject uh, as we consider our stewardship theme uh, in this time. And so now I'm going to turn this over to Ashley.
Hello everyone, I'm so excited to be here today. I just wanted to take a moment and talk about your kids. The kids here at Shalom are incredible humans. You all should be so proud of raising them. Laura Sorensen and I worked with the kids this past month on a new video acknowledging their resilience. It started out as a lesson to teach the youth, but I quickly learned it's a lesson that I needed to be taught myself. Here is a video that the kids worked on. After you ask, or ask, excuse me, after you watch, ask yourselves, how resilient am I? My dog has pushed me to be resilient during COVID. What has made me resilient has been to challenge myself to take hard classes and push myself in swimming. Video games and helping around the house have made me work more resilient. Oh, oh, we are strong. Oh, oh, we are strong. What a wonderful gift and a wonderful example for us. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Laura Lee. And thank you to our young people and to our parents who are teaching us resilience as well. In our Sending Forth, we have our special stewardship theme, Life Finds a Way. So I invite you to join us together as we anticipate leaving this place and continuing the work that we've been called to do. Sending forth, let us share together our sending forth. In hard times when we are anxious and good times that gladden our hearts, life finds a way. In exhausting events, 
that leave us fatigued and bursts of energy that renew our lives. Life finds a way. In moments of confounding mystery and occasions of clear assurance, life finds a way. In troublesome times of scarcity and bountiful seasons of abundance, life finds a way. In perplexing moments of doubt and brilliant flashes of inspiration, life finds a way. In times of planting, nurturing, harvesting, and baking, life finds a way. Life finds a way for us to receive, give, care, and share. Therefore, we commit ourselves anew to God's loving, life-giving ways. Thank you. 